Let's open in our Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. This evening, as we open to 2 Peter 3, I want you to think about the greatest day of our lives. Uh, that's, that's what we're talking about when we get to the second of the seven big events on God's prophetic calendar. As we've been successively going through them, we're at number two, which is the judgment seat of Christ. It's actually called the Bema in Greek, the, the raised platform of Jesus Christ. I call that moment when we each get to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and kneel in front of the one who loved us so much that he came. He took our sins on himself. He died in our place, freely giving us forgiveness and freely giving us salvation through his sacrifice. I call that moment that we finally get to face to face see our Savior, the one who loved us and loosed us from our sin. I call that the greatest day of our life. Now, there are many great days of our life. Uh, uh, in our earthly life, the greatest day is the day of our salvation. Uh, if, if you are born again and you get the privilege of being married to another born-again believer, then the second greatest day of your life on earth will be your marriage because you get to portray Christ and his love for the church. But of all of our existence, the greatest day of our life will be the day that we see him. Because when we see him, we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. And it's just, there's so much scripture involved with that. But I want you to think for a moment of what that, that will be like. Because Peter, and we're going to get in just a moment to the 10th and 11th verse, Peter must have thought his whole saved life about that moment, and he comments on it. But just for us who sometimes don't think of that, just think of what a moment it will be to at last see Jesus. One instant after our last breath, to be taken by the hand of Jesus, to have him lead us up past the marshaled ranks of the angels, along the golden boulevards of glory, up past the cherubim and the seraphim, up and up to the very throne of God himself. And then to hear the Lord Jesus, as it says in Revelation, now see, there's so many details we know of what's going to happen, to hear the Lord Jesus call us by name and present us in person to his Father, and to say that we are his beloved. This is another one I loved and loosed and purchased and took their place. And he presents us to the Father. And then to hear the Father say, bring the best robe and put it on him. Just think of it. A robe of white, as bright as the day, as pure as the light. When the Lord Jesus was transfigured on the mount, something happened. Not only to his face, Something happened also to his clothes. The scriptures tell us in Matthew 17 and the other uh, transfiguration accounts that his clothing began to glow and become as white as light itself. And it says in the Psalms that we actually wear a garment of light. And so that all happens. And what a reward for faithfulness to have a robe like that draped around the shoulders and to be invited to walk the shining ways of glory in the light of transfigured clothes. That's the greatest, that's the richest, that's the most powerful of all the moments of our life when we're clothed in Christ's righteousness. If we really think about that moment long enough, we realize that all that matters is one thing. What will happen at that moment when we see Jesus face to face? Well, now we come to Peter's question. Because in Second Peter chapter 3, in verse 10, Peter, who had followed Jesus since he was a young fisherman. Now remember, Peter was a young fisherman along the shores as he left all to follow Christ. And as he looked back on that day, he must have thought for a long time of what it would be like to again see Jesus face to face. And at the end of his life, we can still hear the voice of that wizened old fisherman with a glowing heart of hope and joy by the name of Peter. He speaks to us by the power of God's Spirit in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. This is what Peter said, captured by the wonder of inspiration in 2 Peter 3, 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, into which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Verse 10. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? 
Peter summarized the end by saying, I'm getting out of this world, I'm going to be before Christ, he's going to make everything new. It's kind of a jet tour of, of prophecy. He wasn't one for details. But you know what he said? You know what prophecy does for me? He said, I don't worry about the charts, and I'm not all concerned. Peter, Peter said he didn't even understand all the stuff Paul said. He said, his stuff's so hard to understand. But I know one thing, he said. I know that all that's going to happen. Verse 11, what manner of persons should I be in holiness and godliness? You know what prophecy did to the early church? You know what it did to Peter? You know what it should do to us? It should change our behavior. It should make us realize we have an appointment. We're going to stand before our Savior. We're going to be all alone on that glassy sea in front of that throne. And it's going to be the single greatest day of our life. So with Peter, we should be asking ourselves, what kind of a person should I be in holy conduct and godliness? Amen? Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that tonight your spirit would stir our hearts, that your spirit would clear away the fog. We've heard and thought and, and wondered about so many things, and I pray that your word would clarify those for us tonight, that we would put away the notion that, that it really doesn't matter what we do from day to day, that we're just going to be there and, and we'll just kind of be in the background because we're not. We're going to be in the foreground. We're going to be all alone standing there, And we will finally be known to all the universe as you have known us all this time. And yes, our sins will be erased, and they have been, and they will stay that way. But it is going to be shown what we were, how cooperative we were with your grace, how yielded we were to your spirit, how much we chose to mortify our flesh and to deny ungodliness and to quench the the growth of lust in our life, then what we really were, that you always saw, everyone else will see. And I pray that tonight, with Peter, we would start pondering what kind of people should we be in holiness and in godliness. And I pray that would translate into little choices we make to deny ungodliness every ungodly way in our life that the spotlight of your spirit through your word reveals that we would make choices to deny and to mortify and to put to death and to root out and to forsake and to flee all those things in the precious name of Jesus we pray amen I want you to think about what's going to happen now now I don't want to confuse you with the second coming of Christ and the rapture next time uh, or the next time after that we're going to actually go through the whole doctrine of the rapture but just think about the 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 wonder of us coming before Christ because that wonder of us coming before Christ is the time that we get to kneel before Jesus Christ and and Paul talks about that remember Peter said it's hard to understand well let's turn back to some of that hard to understand stuff in Romans 14 as Paul explains, and remember the, the scriptures are best understood when the scriptures interpret the scriptures. And so uh, Peter's talking about this incredible moment when everything's going to be dissolved and everything's going to be changed and all of it's going to be new. And John gives us the picture of that in Revelation. And Paul gives us the, the kind of steps back and gives the, the believer's place in all that. It's always Paul that puts the believer in the proper order of what's going to happen to us. And so we find in Romans 14, and starting in verse 10, we are at the second big event on God's prophetic calendar. It's called Christ's judgment seat. The question that Peter says, are you ready? Our future, Peter said, is all about these little incremental choices to live in godliness and holiness because everything else is going to be burned away. But to help us get ready, Paul gives us this chapter 14 reminder. Now remember, don't ever lose the the flow of what's happening here in chapter 14. He's talking about all of these uh, questionable things and liberty and and whether we should uh, flaunt our liberty and show off. And I'm not into that tonight. Uh, That's not what we're covering. But but what he says is that we should do nothing that will offend another believer, even if we have the liberty to do it. We we set aside our liberty. But the the reason for that is in verse 10. And, And he says this, or why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt to your brother? And here is, here is the essence of, of Paul's challenge to us in verse 10. 
For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I remember Paul calls it in 2 Corinthians 5.10, the Bema. Here is where we get the judgment seat of Christ. So it's the judgment raised platform. And, and this is the location for that, that judgment seat. By the way, the word uh, paristomy, the word stand means to be presented. Uh, it's same as in Romans 6 where it says present yourselves as a living sacrifice and present your members as instruments of righteousness. It's a presentation. We're all going to present ourselves. You know how when you're in class and they call roll and you're supposed to say present, you know, present. Well, it's the same idea. It's a roll call of the redeemed, of the saints. And we are going to present ourselves when it's our turn. And we're going to be presented before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Verse 11, for it is written... As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God, verse 12, so then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Now there is what we're talking about. There is an accounting for every moment, for every motive, for every action, for every deed, for every sacrifice or every sacrifice not made. Every moment not given. Every deed not done. There, there is an accounting. It's kind of like when the accountant goes through at the end of the year, the fiscal or the calendar year, and has to make sure that all the payments reconcile and all the income and, and et cetera, et cetera, and that accounting has to happen. There is an accounting for our lives. And there is a record being kept. And the amazing thing is we know from Second Corinthians 5.21 that the sin is all removed, but there's so much left. That's either good or bad, as we saw last time. That's this moment, kneeling before Christ. What will matter when we stand alone right in front of Jesus? What do you wish to have in your hands to give to the one who loved you, who gave himself for you? Whatever that is. We should be concentrating on that today. Because you will never be in the future what you're not becoming today. Don't say, you know, after I get done with school, I'll attend to that. Or, you know, after I get my career started, I'll attend to that. No, you won't. You won't. You'll never be in the future what you're not becoming today. There will always be something else in the way. Life, by the way, doesn't get easier when you get older. It gets more complex. It gets harder. I mean, it's harder to even sleep, as it says in Ecclesiastes. Everything keeps you awake. It's hard to eat. It's hard to everything. You know, life gets more complex the older you get. Don't think you'll have more time. You have less time. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, Ecclesiastes says. And so tonight we are going to go to the throne and the Holy Scriptures transport us out of this world into God's presence. And we see what it will be like to be before the throne. And to do that, let's begin in the book of Revelation. And I want to take you to heaven and to heaven as far as it relates to what we're going to experience And I want you to watch with me what it will be like to be standing at that throne. And watch with me through the eyes of the scripture writers as God pulls back the veil. And through John's eyes in Revelation, starting in chapter 5, we see heaven. As, and by the way, the whole, the whole way that Revelation is postured is as if John is flying over. He's doing these aerials and he's getting to see it from all these vantage points and he's trying to capture it in words. And he rises, as it were, on the wings of angels and gives us a guided tour of heaven. And his inspired portrait for us is a scene of angels. And not just a little bunch, hundreds of millions of angels. You know, sometimes we don't do the math. Numbers fly by us. You know, now the trillions are going by us because of all the trillions of derivatives and, and everything else that's going on in the financial markets. It's just trillions. Do you know how much space... It takes for these people just for the angels to stand in concentric circuit circles the ones that are mentioned would take about 20,000 square miles 20,000 square miles you know here's Michigan it's this whole area right here okay just the angels just just think of the 20,000 miles of, of taking all of central Michigan and just making all that the place where these angels are standing. I mean, we're talking about a big place. You're going to have to have good vision, you know, to see all these people. It's going to be an amazingly 
a, a large number. But all these angels, the Bible says 10,000 times 10,000, that's hundreds of millions of them, are clustered around the smooth crystal sea that reflects the awesome images like a mirror. Uh, the, the throne is in the middle and this glass sea is reflective and yet you can see through it because you can see this rainbow that is a real rainbow. We only see half the rainbows. Remember, rainbows are 360s. We see 180s, or not even uh, that much. But but a true rainbow is a total circle, and that's what encircles this throne. So obviously you can see it. Uh, You can see through this glass sea. And as we look at this, our senses are besieged by so many different sensations. The colors. I mean, God is so into details. When he describes heaven, he gets right down to the colors. And the colors are just unbelievable as you think of what he's talking about. But first of all, starting in chapter 5, the first thing that captures our attention are the angels. There are countless white-robed angels standing like living walls of pure white robes that rise and fall in circular rings reflecting the light of God. I mean, just that. Just I mean, I've never seen hundred million anything. You know, can you imagine seeing hundreds of millions of angels in these circles that are rising and falling as they are bowing down before the Lord? They rise and fall to the sounds of the four creatures that crisscross the expanse on the four corners of the throne. They move as one. They fall down on their faces as they speak the wonders of God's glory. Now that's what's in verse 11 of chapter 5. Revelation 5, 11, I'll read it to you. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of angels that all they do is stand around the throne. You talk about attendance, You know, they measure stars and hotels by how many staff there are to occupants. Can you imagine the star rating of heaven? I mean, God has hundreds of millions that are standing around his throne. They're just his attendants. I mean, he doesn't need them, but he has them. And they're there, and they're worshiping him. And verse 12 says that this whole group... The verse 11, many angels, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, this whole group, verse 12, are saying with a loud voice. Now, just look up for a second. That's why, like in the morning service, did you, did you notice Mark Duncan? He says, come on, let's go, let's go. Did you see a couple times he did that? I don't remember which service it was. You know what he was saying? He was saying, you're being a little quiet here. Because the worship of heaven, look back what it is, saying with a loud voice. God often is into this loudness stuff. Now, I don't mean deafening like the concerts that have blown out a whole generation of people's ears. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the sound that comes when you're totally engaged, when you're not thinking about where you're going to lunch and whether you parked your car, and if you left the windows open, if it's going to rain outside, you know, and all that stuff, you're going to make the soccer game. You don't sing as loud when you've got all that distraction. In heaven, people are only doing one thing. They're on one channel. They're focused on one goal, and that is to speak forth the praises of the infinite Almighty God of the universe. So they say with a loud voice, look at verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. You know that chorus? That is a beautiful chorus. And that is what this innumerable multitude, this hundreds of millions with the redeemed are going to be loudly saying to the Lord. Next, if you look back at chapter 4, the next thing, that catches our attention uh, after the angels will be the floor, if it can be called that. It's an ocean of completely clear and reflective glass. Uh, It's a crystal sea. And in that we can see all the colors and the lights and the objects reflected and amplified. And it says in verse 5 of Revelation chapter 4, And from the throne proceed lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are like the seven spirits, which are the seven spirits of God. Verse 6, before the throne, there was a sea of glass. There it is. It's this floor, whatever it is, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Verse 7, and the first living creature was like a lion, and the second like a calf, and the third had the face of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. 
and the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, and this is called the tri, uh, the, the threefold trisagion, the, the threefold holy, holy, holy. That's where the hymn comes from. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. That's where we get this casting crowns idea. And it's, it, notice it says every time. The, it's, it's like the worship leaders of heaven are these four creatures with all those faces, which, which we'll talk about. And every time they say the threefold, holy, 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 everyone falls down on their faces. So, I mean, it, it must just be a continuous chanting and, and the, the, all the angels falling down and the 24 elders falling down and the, the, you notice the only ones that get to throw something, casting it at Christ's feet at the, at the foot of the throne are the elders, which are 24. The, remember I told you sometime that the only time 24 is used in the whole Bible is the courses of priests. And so we are called a kingdom of priests. And so there is why we have gathered together that this is representative of all the redeemed, the old and the new, the 12 and the 12, all together the redeemed who are around the throne thanking God for Christ's great salvation. And they cast their crowns, which is our rewards before the throne saying, verse 11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Now that, that little section is just more than almost to process. The traditional description of a rainbow, you notice it said there's this rainbow around the throne, is we're told it's made up of seven colors. Remember, seven is the number of completion, and there are seven notes, and the eighth note is the beginning, and so that's the new beginning idea, but seven days in the week, seven notes in the scale of completion. Well, the, the seven colors of the rainbow, uh, which are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, actually the rainbow is a whole continuum of colors from red to violet, even beyond the colors we can see with our eyes. There are many more than those seven colors. It's just a continuum. And the Bible is described, or the throne is described in many of these colors that are reflected. There's the cool emerald green hue that dominates this multicolored rainbow surrounding God's throne. The city that surrounds us. Now remember, there's this heavenly Jerusalem that's out here in the distance. And we're at the throne, but there's this city that, that is surrounding us. And that heavenly city of Jerusalem is having these thick walls of sparkling diamonds. We forget about those so quickly. To get the sensation, if you ever take your ring, you know, if you have a diamond ring and you hold it up to the light and just catch that light and you can just see, I mean, you know, most diamonds are so small that you have to get a magnifying glass to notice them. Can you imagine a city that, that is, that's got these walls and, and all these precious stones and these diamonds that are, that are part of this 1500 mile high city with thick walls of sparkling diamonds. Think of the, the dizzying, dazzling flashes of light and multiply that by diamonds large enough to build walls out of. And then an entire city that is so big, looking down beneath your feet, you see this gold that's transparent. Remember gold in heaven? You can see through it, but it's still gold. Again, you know, we're, we're having trouble processing all this. But all of it is the radiance of God's glory refracted and glistening through the entire city. Everything is made of gems of such beautiful colors that they just shoot forth the light of God's glory. Remember lasers, original lasers were ruby rods that laser means light, amplified, stimulating, stimulated to emit radiation. You know, the whole idea of this light amplified and shot out. Can you imagine heaven, the laser amplification of the light of the glory of God? And so these are the colors of heaven, the colors that God has chosen to surround himself with. His glory is reflected in these hues, the sky blue stones with translucent colored stripes, parallel layers of red and white. These are, if you get all the stones that are mentioned in Revelation and look them up, these are the colors that they are. God has told us the colors of heaven. 
uh, the, the parallel layers of red and white, of orange, red, and brownish red to blood red, a transparent yellowish gold, a light blue aquamarine, a yellowish green, an apple green, a gold tinted green, a deep blue, a shining violet, and an intense purple. Those are the colors of heaven. And those colors will just be all around us as we're standing there waiting in line. And then we see, and if you want to turn back to uh, chapter 7 of Daniel, then we see the next element. We've seen the angels, and then we've seen this this incredible floor. But look at Daniel 7, at the throne itself. And then we see central to heaven in Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10, the very throne of God. This throne is completely encircled by that emerald green rainbow that's over, around, and beneath the throne. We're overwhelmed by the massive rumble of power, the endless peals of thunder and flashes of lightning that seem to radiate outward from within it. That's what chapter 4 told us about, that there are, there's this lightning coming out this way from the throne, and there's this constant rumble of thunder, and you've got these four creatures that we're going to be introduced to soon with these faces around, and all this reflective floor but look at we as we look at daniel 7 john says that there's loud voices and it's like a roaring waterfall past those seven blazing pillars of fire but daniel that that prophet of the old testament also saw the same scene and also brings a whole different perspective that john doesn't even tell us about because probably He was just so overwhelmed at what he saw, he only recorded a little bit of it. But in verse 9 of Daniel 7, Daniel, seeing the same scene, said this, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. Revelation 1 records that. The hair of his head was like pure wool. Again, this pure white. Revelation 1 has that. This is where Daniel starts adding more detail. His throne was a fiery flame. So the whole throne is, is burning like fire. I, I mean, right away, I mean, whoa. We don't even think in terms of that. You know, we think of gold or wood, but it's on fire. It's fiery flame. It's wheels of burning fire. So the fire is moving in a circular way. And look at this, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. That's the Ancient of Days on the throne. So so at the, the stairway coming out in front of him, there is a river of fire flowing. I remember on Easter Sunday in 1990, preaching the Easter Sunday morning message in I was pastoring in Rhode Island at that time. And I remember just saying, if anybody here, like we heard in the testimony uh, from the baptistry tonight, I said, if any of you would like to come to the risen Christ, you come this very moment. The place was packed. It was a New England church, and people were standing in the back. It was just a big service. And I said, if you want to come to Christ, come now. Let nothing delay. And, and there were so many people there that I, you know, I didn't notice how many had come. And people were going like this and pointing. And so I assigned people to go over and pray. And the person that came forward that morning, it was a couple, their family owned the Boston Red Sox. They were one of those kind, you know, the old blue bloods. And they had, they had been standing at the back and attending services and were gripped by reality of Christ and were saved that morning. I didn't even know. They were over there on that side. I was working on this side. And it just happened that part of their businesses, they owned foundries, big, you know, uh, steel-making places. And after I discipled this fellow for a while, he says, you ought to come see some of our factories. I said, I'd love to see some of your factories. And we went up to see some of his factories. And he said, he said, I've been reading the Bible, and I found this Daniel chapter 7 stuff. And he said, could I show you a little bit of what that's going to look like? I said, oh, sure. And he took me into to the big um, place where they melt the, the iron and, and for casting. And he says, watch this. And he said, I'm going to really spend a lot of money now. And he cranked up the electric, they, they melt all that in the blast furnaces, but they also keep it hot with these electric furnaces. And he just, he had the controller crank that thing up, and I looked through with my goggles on, through this thick glass, and you could just see the steel boiling. It was like boiling syrup or boiling water. I mean, he turned it up to it was just boiling, and it was just, it was so bright, and it just looked like diamonds and gold. I mean, you just can't, until you see it, it's just like looking at lava. 
And he says, now watch this. And he had them dump the bucket. And I don't know what they had something ready for it. But, but they just dumped that thing. And a river of fire went down that whatever it was, it was going down. And I will never forget that day with that new believer as he said, I see Daniel 7. Look back at verses 9 and 10. It says, the ancient of days was seated there and he doesn't have any blast furnace and he doesn't need the Boston uh, baseball teams or anything. He's just sitting there and his throne is on fire and this fiery stream is issuing out and coming out before him. And for just a moment, as that boiling steel went down that trough, I thought we just for an instant have a little taste of the majesty of God on high. But look what else is happening in verse 10. A thousand thousands ministered to him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. You see, John and Daniel are looking at the very same thing. It's the hundreds of millions are there. But John didn't mention to us that while the lightning's going out like this and the thunder is rumbling and all these creatures are crisscrossing and everybody's falling on their faces, there's this river of fire that flows before. Remember what the writer of Hebrews says? Our God is a what? Consuming fire. Maybe that's a little bit of this, this throne on fire and this river of fire. But then, and if you want to go onward back from uh, Daniel to Isaiah, there's another element that gets our attention after that throne with all that fire and, and fiery river and all that. Look at Isaiah chapter 6. Because in Isaiah 6, we, we, as our eyes are glancing around, I mean, as you're walking up to your spot to stand before the throne of the majesty on high, you, know, you notice all the angels, and, and then you, you notice the glass reflective mirror floor, and then the throne with all the lightning and thunder and fire and all. But then you look up and you go, whoa. And you start seeing these burning ones, they're called. And, and they're described two times in the Bible. In Isaiah 6, our eyes turn to follow the four glistening living beings, each with four distinct faces, lion, calf, man, eagle, and completely covered with eyes. They move like flashes of light with fire passing between them, gliding through the expanse around the Ancient of Days in theocentric orbit, always facing the Almighty. There's a little interesting thing. The reason they have four faces is that wherever you look, you would see all four of the faces. All, because each of them have all four, but because they're square and because they're, they're on the four corners moving around, you would always see all four faces because that's how the Lord designed it as they do their God-centered orbit. But here's a description of some of these burning ones. These are the seraphim. Seraph means the burning one. Cherubim, these are, you know, whether these are the same or subsets or whatever, we do know that Satan was the highest cherub. He was the anointed cherub. So I hate to blow your pictures of the guy in the red tights and the little pitchfork and thing, but Satan actually has four faces. He's a cherub. We know what he looks like. He's covered with eyes, um, but we're not into Satanology tonight. But look at this. Isaiah 6, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. So now Isaiah is seeing the same scene, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe. Oh, so so Isaiah adds that, filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, the burning ones. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, now this is amazing, just getting a glimpse of God, seeing him, affects people. I remember my few times I've watched some of the charismatic programming. And I believe many, many, many charismatics are born again, just like many, many Baptists and many, many Bible church people. Not all charismatics are saved. Not all people in this church are saved. It's only those who have had a living relationship with Jesus Christ. But I have noticed on charismatic television this notion that they regularly bump into the Lord. 
I remember in Tulsa, Oral Roberts was always bumping into the Lord. Sometimes he was 900 feet tall. You know, he just bumped into Jesus here and there. I remember another charismatic pastor that used to shave and talk to Jesus. He'd watch him in the mirror, standing behind him, and he would keep shaving. Did you notice what happens when you get anywhere near the Lord? Verse 5. I said, woe is me. I am, I'm disintegrating. Just like Job said, I've seen you and I'm falling apart. I'm, and Isaiah said the same thing. I am undone. I'm falling apart because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When you get a true sight of the Lord, you don't keep shaving. You fall. Look what John did. When John saw the Lord, he fell on his face like a dead person in Revelation chapter 1. We need to, in our worship, in our devotional time, in our prayer time, we need to see the Lord more. It's the most humbling thing to see the Lord. We are undone. We realize that we are unclean lips. We dwell in the midst of an unclean lip people. We see the king. And then look at verse 6. Then one of the seraphim, one of these burning ones, flew to me, having in his hands a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And if you compare this, John sees the same thing. He sees this altar and the coals and this whole thing in Revelation, especially as it involves in chapter 8, our prayers in chapter 8, verse 3. But he touched my mouth with it. So this, this burning one takes a tong and gets a burning coal and brings it up and touches Isaiah's Uh, mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. So the burning ones capture our focus, along with the floor and the throne and the angels. Just before we go tonight, we've got to see one more thing. Look at chapter 4 of Revelation and verse 4 again, and we'll just do one more because heaven's going to be amazing. By the way, if you're saved, you'll see all this, so don't worry if you miss any of it tonight, right? But we're just reading it tonight. We're getting ready. It's kind of like going on the tour before you get there. But after we see the burning ones, then we see a circle just beyond the burning pillars of fire. Remember these seven spirits, these flames of fire that are before the throne, and those four living creatures that surround the throne. But look at Revelation 4.4, 4, because... There are 24 smaller thrones seated with white robed celestial men. I mean, you know, that this coming before, remember the whole idea of this, we're coming before the judgment seat of Christ, but as we're getting there, we're just going, whoa, you know, whoa, look at hundreds of millions of angels, and look at that mirror floor. Whoa, look at that lightning, look at that, listen to the thunder and the sounds and that throne and the fire and those creatures. But then we look back and we see around the throne closest. Isn't that interesting? Where are the angels and the living creatures? But who's right there? Right, right there. The closest. 24 thrones. Wow. Revelation 4.4. 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in those white robes like we talked about tonight. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And if you zip over to chapter 5, verse 8, it says, And when he'd taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, there they are again in Revelation 5.8, fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Remember I told you God likes prayer. He collects them. You ought to pray a lot. We all should be more involved in praying without ceasing because that's important to God. Verse 14, Then the four living creatures said, Amen, in Revelation 5, 14. And there they are again. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Each man holds a harp, each one wears a crown, each one holds a golden bowl, and these golden bowls contain the worship offered by God's saints on earth, and repeatedly we see those 24 elders falling on their faces, pouring out to the Lord the collected worship of the saints as the hosts of heaven are loudly chanting the glory of God, 
And with a mighty sound blending in together, we hear the voices, the thunders, the sounds of the entire universe in one crystal clear affirmation. And that's chapter 4, verse 8, if you want to turn back there. And this is what is going on constantly. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And as we watch those 24 elders rise and fall under the awesome expanse of space over the throne that sparkles like pure and the crystal blue pavement like it's called in Exodus. And finally, that special moment, every angel, every elder, every saint fall prostrate before him. And those four great angels, those 424 elders and the hundreds of millions around the sea and most of all us, And it says we join together, as chapter 5 and verse 12 says of Revelation, and we finally get to sing with them. And we sing, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength, honor and glory and blessing. Now do you see why Martin Luther at the end of his life, said, you know what kept me going against the Pope and the church and against all the armies and all the evil of of Satan trying to overthrow me? He says, I just have two things I think about today and the day that I'm going to stand before the throne we looked at tonight. Jonathan Edwards similarly said these words. He said, I have resolved to never do anything I would not want to be found doing by Jesus Christ at his return. Are you ready this evening to appear before Christ's throne? And Father in heaven, we stand before you, and we want to join with those four living creatures, and we want to join with the 24 elders and the hundreds of millions of angels, and we want to say to you that you are holy, 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 and that you are our Lord God Almighty. We worship you tonight, O Lord. Thank you for loving us and redeeming us. And we look forward to that day that you clothe us with that robe and we get to stand and then we get to kneel and then we get to cast everything we were on this earth for your glory and we get to cast it at your feet, and say, for you alone are worthy. I pray with Peter that we would ask ourselves tonight and tomorrow, since all this is going to happen, what manner of men and women and young men and women ought we to be in holiness and godliness? In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.